Welcome to the Mobile Workforce Podcast, where we sit down and have real conversations with business leaders that have been where you are. During these interviews, we'll dive into what it takes to improve systems and champion processes that maximize performance. Each week, our trailblazing guests share their experiences and understanding of the workforce to help inspire change, challenge our thinking, and share what it takes to successfully travel the road to profitability. Now here's our host, co-founder and chief evangelist of About Time and WorkMax, Mike Merrill. Hello, and welcome to the Mobile Workforce Podcast. I am your host, Mike Merrill, and today we are joined by the president and CEO of CFMA, Stuart Binstock. And Stuart is highly regarded as an expert in construction finance. I've known Stuart for many years, and we work together within the CFMA organization. Really excited to have him on today. But we're going to take a little bit different spin on things and shine a light on a topic that's a little bit different from construction finance today. We're going to talk about a topic that Stuart and I both feel like is uh, probably under discussed or not discussed often enough, and that is mental health. So Stuart actually leads the Construction Industry Alliance for Suicide Prevention. So we're grateful to have him on today to have this important conversation and discussion. And uh, welcome today, Stuart. We're excited to have you on. Thank you, Mike. A pleasure to be there. You bet. Um, before we get into the, the deeper part of the conversation, could you just share with the listeners a little bit about your background and what CFMA is? Sure. Uh, so CFMA is a national organization. We're an individual member uh, association. We have somewhere right now between 8,500 and 9,000 members in 99 chapters around the country. Uh, Our membership is composed primarily uh, about 65% of folks on the finance side of construction companies and about 35% of companies, uh, folks like sureties, CPAs, uh, software companies that want to work for those companies. So it's a very uh, powerful synergy that we bring everybody in the construction industry together uh, to talk about construction finance. Uh, I've been with CFMA now for about 10 years. I'm very proud of what we've been able to accomplish over those last 10 years. We've gone, probably increased membership by about 20 to 30% and probably in terms of revenue about the same. Um, but I'm perhaps the thing I'm most proud of is that we've increased member value, I think significantly over the last 10 years through a myriad of things that we've done. Uh, but I think uh, our members get a lot of value for spending less than $500 for being a member of both the national organization and a local chapter. Yeah, that's great, Stuart. Thank you for that background. And we, as an organization at About Time Technologies and WorkMax, we are involved every year and we go to the events, we plug in, we we rub elbows and uh, talk to folks that are members of CFMA and, and just a lot of value that the members get and come away with. And and I notice they always come back every year. Nobody ever seems to leave CFMA. They just seem to keep coming. Well, I think, you know, folks like you have really, uh, we are we are kind of the sweet spot for companies like yours that you, I mean, you essentially, I, I hear this from companies all the time. We need to be at the CFMA annual conference. It's the most important event of the year for us because that's where uh, the decision makers that will decide on our particular product, uh, we can find them all in one place. And yes, we have a very dedicated uh, group of uh, members, Mike. It's uh, always kind of amazes me. Our founder, David Casey, just did an interview with our chair, Pam Hepburn. And he said, she asked him, she said, what is the one thing that kind of surprises you still to this day? And he poignantly said, I think it's the passion of the leadership, the volunteer leadership of CFMA that has never waned and in fact, it almost seems to have increased over the years. Yeah, and I can attest to that. I, I see it, like you said, every year at the national conference. We go to the local chapter conferences, and, and we just uh, we do get excited every time we get to get involved with the CFMA event. The, yep. the biggest surprise to me is how plugged in, like you said, the passion, but also how companies are willing to share best practices with one another. Even though they may be competitive in some environments, they still – work together and try and raise the kind of the level of everyone's performance together. Well, the best example I can give you of that, Mike, is uh, uh, something we on our uh, 
website we call the Connection Cafe. Mm -hmm. And it's an opportunity for members to raise questions uh, to members and get them asked, answered by, you know, the 8,500 to 9,000 members. It's incredible the amount of uh, information that our members um, share with one another. They are competitors and they're not going to tell them the secret sauce and the anything that makes their company particularly different, but they will share information, for instance, on ERP systems. Uh, I got to tell you, our members can be brutally honest and make comments that I'm sure make some of the ERPs wince a little bit, but it's a very <laughs> open and honest conversation. I think it's by itself, it's worth CFMA membership is just plugging in and looking at the Connection Cafe on a daily basis. And I think you get just, uh, it's kind of like uh, CFO 101 uh, on that uh, on that listserv. Yeah, and I can attest to that. I've been in some of the chat threads where there's 50 or 100 or more comments back and forth. And you got people from Ohio locking arms with somebody in California and Virginia and Florida. And people are weighing in from everywhere. And again, sharing what they've learned so that everybody doesn't have to go through those speed bumps all the yep. time. Yep. So, love it. Well, uh, again, highly encourage everybody to check out CFMA. That's Construction Financial Management Association. Uh, the annual conference is amazing. They've got a lot of online events, monthly webinars. We, we love being involved. But more importantly for today, as much as we love CFMA, and I'm sure you uh, get to talk about it all the time, we really wanted to shine a brighter light on something that is a little bit more important and uh, a challenge in our society today. And I think uh, the, my question is, how did Stuart Binstock, this financial guy, get involved in suicide prevention? Well, first of all, let me make a minor correction. I think you may have said something about me leading the Construction Industry Alliance for Suicide Prevention. Uh, CFMA started uh, CIASP, but we are very pleased that we have joined in with many other organizations to now create an entity that's separate and apart from CFMA. Uh, I'm on the uh, board of trustees of the Construction Industry Alliance for Suicide Prevention. So I don't want to take credit for leaving it, nor do I want to get the blame in case we do something <laughs> wrong. So I just want to clarify that. But the answer to how a finance guy got involved in uh, suicide prevention, I think it comes with just one simple phrase. And that's people make a difference. And about five years ago, one of our members, a uh, very uh, beloved and uh, cherished member, a guy named Cal Byer, came forward and penned an article with a, a doctor who, who deals with this issue, Dr. Sally Spencer Thomas. Mm -hmm. And they wrote an article about suicide prevention. Uh, our publisher of our magazine, Christy Domboski, came in to me. And Christy said, uh, Stuart, uh, we just got this article on suicide prevention. What do we do about that? And Christy and I looked at each other quizzically. You know, we usually talk about tax law, succession planning. Uh, right. Suicide prevention is not in our wheelhouse. And we both decided, well, let's give it a whirl and see what happens. And we had no idea what was going to happen uh, from that article. But from that article, there was just an incredible outpouring particularly on the Connection Cafe, I might add, of mm -hmm. members who were impacted by suicide uh, by a family member or a friend or a co-worker. And um, we found out that this issue was very real and resonated with our members in ways we never envisioned. Wow, that is that is very profound. And, uh, and I can only imagine, I, I think in society today, we we're doing a better job of raising awareness, but I think this impacts all industries, but in construction specifically, it's, there's a lot of stress and pressure. And just because me as an individual may not be going through something doesn't mean that your crew member to the right or to the left of you isn't. So, Well, that that's true. And, and I will say, first of all, and I think it's important to say, this is a, this is not just a nationwide problem. This is a worldwide problem. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've talked to folks in Australia and the UK who have programs like CIASP in the construction industry, uh, frankly, they've done a better job than we have in focusing on this. And that's really, um, that's really our mission in uh, CISP is awareness, is making people aware that this problem exists. And of course, it exists nationwide, way beyond um, the construction industry. It, 
is a problem that youth have. Uh, I've been told, uh, the quote I've been given many times is 132 veterans die by suicide every day. Wow. Which is a startling and very overwhelming and uh, awful number. Uh, but it is a nationwide problem. The, the problem for us in construction is that the CDC did a report in Center for Disease Control, did a report in 2016 and later in 2018, and found out that construction had the highest suicide rate of any industry in the United States. That was a real uh, punch in the gut for all of us. And I think that it was not only a punch in the gut, but it made us realize how important this initial uh, initiative was and how important it was to carry it on. Wow. Well, I know CFMA is always involved in good causes, charities, other things, but it's really um, very, I mean, I, I just have reverence for the fact that they have put this organization together and taken this initiative because I, I do know, I come from the industry and I do know and understand that this is a real problem. And it makes me wonder, I don't know if you know the answer, but who seems to be the most at risk of this plague really is what well, it is. We, we look at the workforce, the labor workforce, and that's, that's really where, where this lies. By the way, I want to just mention one thing before I forget. Uh, I do have an opportunity to go out and speak to an awful lot of groups. And one of the groups I spoke to a year or two ago now, I, given COVID, I forget when it was, probably close to a year and a half ago now. And it was the largest construction companies uh, in the United Sa States and all of their safety directors. They have their own, you know, kind of particular small group, about 30 to 50 of the largest construction companies in the United States. And uh, I am a lawyer by uh, training, and you're always taught never to ask a question uh, that you don't know the answer to. But I went out on that plank, and I decided to go ahead and ask the question. So at the beginning of my presentation, I asked them, how many of you have had a suicide on the job or aware of an employee who has died by suicide? Two thirds of those companies raised their hands. Once again, that was also it's just an incredible punch in the gut to see how prevalent this is. But let me go back to answering your question, Mike. So, sure. white men from the ages of twenty to fifty are kind of the the group that die by suicide the most. And if you know anything about the workforce in the construction industry, it is largely white men ages twenty to fifty. So um, male dominated industries tend to have more suicides and uh, Caucasians uh, die by suicide more than uh, others. And we are unfortunately primarily, uh, and hopefully this will change, but largely a Caucasian uh, workforce. But um, there's also kind of the nature of the work that has impacted this and explains in part why suicide is so high in the construction industry. First of all, there's this kind of tough guy mentality, uh, kind of stoic, uh, you know, I'm not going to tell you if anything's bothering me uh, there. And because of that, there are a fair number of injuries on, on work sites. This is not sitting at your desk. You all know that. And so uh, people uh, have uh, pain issues. And unfortunately, sometimes they deal, they use opioids. Sometimes they get in problems with opioids and opioids and suicide are very, very much uh, related. Uh, there's also kind of the isolation uh, when, when uh, sometimes a company has a project and it's out of town, so people mm -hmm. will travel uh, and they'll be out of town and they'll be alone for months on end. And that's not good for anybody's uh, mental health. There's uh, project layoffs, uh, you know, end of the season kind of layoffs. So there's kind of the financial stress, um, that, that that causes. There's sleep deprivation due to shift work. Sure. Uh, unfortunately, there's a tolerant culture for alcohol and substance abuse. Um, and, um, and then the, probably some people say the biggest impact is access to lethal means. Uh, I, I'm not sure it's fair to say there's a gun culture in the construction industry, but it might be an accurate statement to make. And the more access you have to lethal means, the more able people are. Uh, what what uh, experts tell me is, you know, sometimes this is a spur of the moment uh, decision that somebody makes. And then that spur of the moment, if you have access to lethal means, 
you're probably going to be more successful in doing and dying by suicide than others that don't have access to those limited means. That's a kind of a weird way to think about it, but it, it, if you think about it, it's true. Yeah, it's a very eye-opening and, and a, you know, difficult to even think about. I mean, even talking about it, it's a, a challenge. It feels heavy, no question about it. How do, how do companies create a culture that helps avoid or improve people that are struggling with these things? Do you, do you have any insights to that? Well, we, we talk about that and, uh, you know, uh, I really encourage people uh, after listening to this to go to preventconstructionsuicide.com. That's the, um, that's the website for the Construction Industry Alliance for Suicide Prevention. And we have a fair number of tools. We have uh, an, an assessment tool that a company can take. I encourage uh, companies to look at this. Um, and it is called, I want to just make sure I get the, the name right so you understand what we're talking about, a needs analysis and implementation tool. So it really goes through a company and it helps you determine if you have addressed some of the issues uh, that either might negate uh, this from happening. So you create a healthy um, and well-being kind of culture, a caring culture in your organization. That's one of the ways in which you can do this. I encourage folks to look at this needs analysis and integration uh, checklist. And I think if a company goes through that, they'll probably learn some things along the way that they can do better uh, to support uh, their people. Because at the outset, and let me be very clear about this, you know, the most important asset a construction company has are its people. And if you're not going to invest in your people, then you're missing out on the most valuable resource and you're missing out on the place where you can probably make the biggest difference. Hmm. Wow. Profound statement. Yeah. Equipment and machines don't have a heart or a brain. Not, not that I know of. I mean, maybe they will in a few years uh, as I watch uh, different shows, Mike, but not now. Wow. Yeah. So I, I know in construction, obviously we we do toolbox talks or safety trainings and requirements for OSHA and other things. Are, are those some areas that you're seeing companies take advantage of an opportunity to communicate more clearly about these issues? Absolutely, Mike. Absolutely. Yes. So we have some toolbox talks uh, on our website. Uh, I think another uh, element that's important is to have a, uh, an effective employee assistance program. A lot mm -hmm. of companies have EAPs, but they, what I've been told is they vary substantially. So you really might want to look at your EAP and determine whether it will bring value to members, whether uh, employees will really consider using it um, and whether it, it helps them uh, address some of the mental health problems. It's, it's that whole building a caring culture, a support. Those mm -hmm. two things, building a caring culture in the construction industry, don't exactly go hand in hand. It's not, <laughs> those two words don't usually uh, coincide, but... It, it's something to consider and think about doing if you want uh, to have everyone come home at the end of the day safe and sound. Yeah, I, I love that. I, I know, I mean, here in our organization, one thing we do is regularly we'll have book clubs. And I not that I necessarily know that construction companies are going to do something like that, but I can tell you firsthand that that is a wonderful experience to get to know people personally and to be more vulnerable in, in ways where you can communicate some about some of these things that are not easy to talk about out on a job site necessarily. Right. That's, you're absolutely right, Mike. I mean, this is not the conversation you have on the on the uh, work site. You know, you don't walk up to Joe and go, you know, you look a little bummed out today, Joe. Are you thinking of uh, dying by suicide? And by the way, right. you'll note I use the expression die by suicide. I don't say commit suicide. And that's because right. people who kind of, uh, work in this field, don't really believe someone can commit to suicide. It's There's got to be an underlying mental health issue for someone to die by suicide. So you won't hear people uh, knowledgeable in this area talk about someone committing suicide. You still hear it on TV, but it's interesting. Every once in a while, I'll hear somebody on the news talk about this issue and say they died by suicide. That's really the proper uh, phraseology to use. 
Yeah, and I heard a statistic, and maybe I'm speaking out of turn here. I don't have the exact reference, but I did hear and, and read a story, and, and they talked about survivors of, of that attempt. And in 100% of the cases that they interviewed, they all had regretted uh, making that choice. And that's why I mentioned lethal means and spur of the moment, because that's mm-hmm. exactly right. A, a lot of this does happen kind of in that spur of the moment, and someone has access to lethal means. They can accomplish what they probably would regret afterwards, but it's too late. So you're absolutely right, Mike. Yeah, and I, I know, uh, so we've talked about, I mean, I brought up the book club idea. You you talked about Toolbox Talks. Are there some other tips or tricks or ways that companies can uh, bring this subject up more comfortably? Well, we have uh, within uh, the uh, website, we do have Living Works training. So it's, it's a mm-hmm. group called Living Works. And they've created some training programs. Uh, you know, you could start off and have your supervisors trained through this Living Works program. It's really a nominal fee uh, through our website. Right? Every once in a while, I'm, I'm not sure where we are right now, but sometimes we even offer the training for free. Um, and But if it's not for free, it's for a nominal fee. And you could get maybe your supervisory staff trained uh, and go through that program. It's not very long. And uh, that would, I think, help uh and, you know, the, there's an, another expression that people in this area talk about and Cal Byer used to talk about and still does, um, mm-hmm. which is remove the stigma. Remove the stigma of having this conversation. And I would say that's probably the most important thing you can do as, as a company. The single most important thing you can do is remove the stigma. Uh, because, you know, uh, I gave a speech on a uh, association that has safety and health conference, and I kind of leveled them a little bit. And I said, you know, I know you're going to talk about safety. I'm not sure how much you're going to talk about health during this pre- uh, during this two-day conference, but I can damn well almost guarantee you will not be talking about mental health. And right. that's because people are afraid to talk about it. They're not, it, it's not an easy topic to talk about, but you've got to start the conversation. And that's, you know, part of our message is do something. Start the conversation somehow. Go have some fe- folks in your company go through training. Have an EAP, do a toolbox talk. There are a myriad of ways. Have go through the integration uh, checklist. There are a myriad of things you can do to start uh, in this area. Yeah, I know. Just statistically speaking, I'm I'm a hundred percent confident that we have somebody listening to this right now that's either contemplated uh, this action or they know somebody who has. What would you tell that person that is dealing with that right now that, that might be listening? Well, I mean, one of the dilemmas in this area, particularly for construction companies, is we are not mental health experts. Right. And so thinking that you are and you're going to be able to provide mental health expertise to someone, I think, is a mistake. And so you need to get them in touch with something like the suicide prevention hotline. We have on the website the warning signs to look for for someone who might be thinking of having suicidal thoughts, either someone in your company or even if someone's listening today who has this, they should uh, contact the suicide prevention line and immediately, and they will get some kind of assistance. If you are talking to someone who has suicidal thoughts and they admit to those suicidal thoughts to you, it's probably important to not leave them alone. You probably want to initiate getting them some help, and then then you can leave somebody alone. But you you probably should not leave somebody alone who uh, has expressed some of these thoughts. If that's for you, who someone is listening, or someone who you're in your company, you want to help let them get some help before you um, leave them alone. I think that's just a basic, important premise. Yeah, and I think, like you said earlier, there these things are often a spur of the moment, or you know, they may come on quickly, and so it it would it would be urgent that uh, that we don't leave anybody in that moment. The the other thing I'll tell you, Mike, and uh, this isn't come from me, but it comes from mental health experts, and it's in in our living works training. There's nothing wrong with asking someone if they have suicidal thoughts. I know when I first went through the training, I thought, 
why would I ask somebody that? What if I spurred them to do something that they weren't already thinking of? Mental yeah. health experts tell us, if you ask someone that and they said yes, it's not like you put it in their head. They were already thinking of it. So you shouldn't be shy about asking that if you see someone that you think has some signs of this. It's important to actually get that out. Uh, and, you know, sometimes just talking to somebody can make somebody feel better. This is, you know, this is not, this is kind of a, a labor intensive kind of issue. There's not, you can't have a process in place and have someone go through four steps and feel like they're going to be great at the end of the tunnel. This is one-to-one -one kind of personal contact that you need to make uh, and connect with somebody uh, and, you know, take them aside and, uh, and ask them, uh, you know, how they're doing. I, I, I did a webinar yesterday for a group and somebody asked the question, uh, I'm a female supervisor and I think it would be really hard for me to approach uh, one of my older laborers and ask them and, you know, I don't think they'd be that receptive. And I think a good response to that is, well, find someone who they value, find someone who they, you know, look up to or, you know, see as an equal peer and have that person uh, do the work for you. Uh, but don't not do it because you think you're the wrong person. Find somebody else uh, to have that conversation. Yeah, I love that. And I love how you said earlier, this is a process and it's not just like four quick steps. I mean, it's not like pulling a sliver out or something. I mean, there's... Right. This is a deeper seated issue that probably requires some professional help and direction by those that know how to best help that person. But uh, in the absence of that or before that can happen, talking about it, raising awareness, normalizing it to a degree that, yep. that you know, you understand and it's OK. Yep, that's that's the whole notion of removing the stigma. Yep, that's exactly right. Love that. Well, so obviously very heavy subject and, and uh not easy to talk about or even think about, but I, I think uh, I think it's important. And I'm so thankful that you're able to share this with us today. Is there a website URL? Obviously, we'll link it in the show notes and elsewhere, but uh, can you tell us where to find this information easily? Preventconstructionsuicide.com. That's the Construction Industry Alliance for Suicide Prevention's website. It has a whole host of things. One of the things we would like people to do is stand up to suicide prevention. So that... Uh, uh, the, the, that's an acronym, acronym that stands for five different things. And we want people to kind of take the pledge to stand up for suicide prevention. Uh, and we'd love companies to do that. Uh, we, uh, we run this organization on a shoestring budget. If anyone mm -hmm. has the wherewithal and feels compelled to support this, um, we, we would love that kind of support. We get it periodically from some uh, big, com big construction companies. Um, and we very much appreciate the support that we get. Uh, anything you can do to help support that. Here at CFMA, every year at our conference, we have a, a run, a fun run, and uh, it's for charity. And every year over the last couple of years, uh, we've made uh, all of the funds that we've been able to accumulate uh, go to uh, CISP. I think last year, we were able to give CISP $17,000. So um, um, anyone who's feels compelled to do that we'd love to hear from you as well that's great and do you have like a donate now button on the website or is there, there is. Yep. okay yep there is fantastic i and i will certainly raise awareness to this uh as i am able and use our platform to do the same we're we're heavily involved in our local agc chapter also and so i will bring this to the attention of of our local group here as well you know uh, agc and uh Actually, uh, ABC are both very involved uh, in this initiative. The, the current chair of CISP is actually a staff member of ABC. Uh, but the problem that we find, and this is true of CFMA, is we have this national initiative, and we believe in it very much from the headquarters level, but it doesn't always get filtered down to the chapter level. So anything somebody can do to help uh, grow this initiative and grow the interest at a local level is really important. That's that the grassroots is where it's really happening. I love that. And that's CFMA is definitely a grassroots organization. How many, how many years has CFMA been in existence? This is our 40th anniversary. So you good wow. question, Mike, the uh, perfect timing for me to plug uh, CFMA's 40th anniversary. 
Wow. Yeah, I was going to say it's got to be the high 30s at least. So 40, that's that's a big deal. Yeah. Love that. Well, so before before we wrap up, and again, thank you for having that uh, difficult, heavier conversation, because I think it is very important. And I appreciate the opportunity to help you get the word out on that. I do have a few personal questions for you. Uh, <laughs> not too personal. Okay. Uh, Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been to a few cocktail mixers with you here and there. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, we're going down. We're going down a, a rabbit hole here. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. CFMA does have a lot of fun. They they do they do find some time to let loose a little bit. But they do they absolutely do. <laughs> love so that uh, our, love that about our members. Yeah, that's a great time. So uh, thanks again for uh, for helping us learn more about this important organization. Um, just to wrap up, what is one thing that you are grateful for in your professional life? Uh, well, grateful for, I'd certainly say my, uh, my family, but my professional life, this, uh, the last 10 years, CFMA has been the highlight of my uh, career. Uh, no, no, no question about it. I've dealt with an amazing group of volunteers, um, as I talked about before, we have really passionate uh, leaders uh, as part of our organization, and uh, they are so dedicated to this organization. Uh, if I was heading down a wrong path, they would correct me very quickly. I try not to go down any wrong paths, but if I was, trust me, I'd, I'd get uh, yanked back into reality. Uh, we really have some tremendous volunteers. We have folks who volunteer on our committees. Um, we have an executive committee. We have an officer group. Uh, just they're all super, super dedicated to this organization. Well, that's great. Well, I, I love that. And and I know it's clear you love CFMA. And I know that CFMA certainly loves you, Stuart. So thank you very much. Um, what about uh, what about a skill or a superpower, something you've kind of developed or learned over the years and, and, and honed that's been a blessing to you in, in your pursuits? Well, um, I guess, uh, I'm someone, I believe I'm not, this is not a superpower. I was <laughs> going to say two separate things. First of all, I do believe, uh, physical health is connected to mental health. And mm -hmm. so I do pretty religiously walk 10,000 steps a day. You can't see nice. it in my physique because that hasn't changed <laughs> all that much, but it does make me feel good. And I think it's really important to get out there and, and, you know, I, so I do walk uh, 10,000 steps, which is about five miles every day. Uh, at the end of the day, if I haven't walked my five miles, I'll walk around in my house, uh, walk, walk up the stairs, and down the stairs. It looks <laughs> kind of silly, but I'm pretty committed to my uh, my 10,000 steps. The other thing I would just say from a business standpoint, uh, I've really been a firm believer uh, in keep your head down and do your job and you'll be recognized. Uh, mm -hmm. Once again, that's not a superpower, but that is kind of a belief that I have. Uh, too many people, I think, worry about, you know, did I get credit for that? Did I get credit for this? Trust me, you get noticed when you do something well in an organization. And you don't have to tell yourself. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, there's no, there is absolutely no substitute for activity, getting things done, right? Hard work. Love it. Uh, so what about in your career earlier on? Are there, are there some things that you worked through that you've improved upon and you wish you, your younger self would have known earlier? Anything you could share with, with our listeners? I, I would say, yeah, certainly, yes, under that category. And I think one of those is, you know, if you're going to lead an organization, make sure you better look behind and make sure you got people supporting you and they're behind you instead of knifing you in the back. And that can happen. You can get knifed in the back if you're too far out front. You have to uh, mm -hmm. There's a delicate balance in leading an organization to lead and yet follow the lead of those that you're trying to lead. And uh, sometimes I would say in my career, I, uh, I just forged ahead and I was going like blockbusters, gangbusters. I turned around and I went, oh, uh, there's not really anybody supporting this. <laughs> Where's <is> everybody? <laughs> Uh, I think I better look backwards before I look forwards and uh, make sure I have the support of people. And you don't get the support of people when they think you're a little too out front and you're uh, you're trying to do things that not are 
are not supported by the whole group. That's an interesting insight. I think uh, that's not one I've heard before on the podcast. So thank you for bringing that up. Okay. It's important to make sure your team's still with you. Yep. Uh, leadership means you're st- you're still there, having an effect on them, not yep. not out ahead, too far yep. of the group. The yep. group. Love that. What about uh, is there one challenge or something really you know that was difficult that you that you overcame and uh, and what did you learn from that experience? Well, I think over the years I've learned that it's really important to collaborate. Um, you know, when I came on board with the staff, um, I inherited a staff, and I'm not sure I would have hired every single person that was on the staff, mm. but I think. Uh, over the years, we've built a team here and you don't do this by yourself and collaborating with uh, my team and giving and, and giving them the power uh, to do things on their own, uh, I think has been very, very uh, freeing to them and I think important to our success. I think they really appreciate uh, having the freedom uh, within certain parameters of the organization to do the right thing for the organization and then collaborate to get, uh, w- together. I think uh, no one is an island. No one does it on their own. And I've learned, I, I think I really have learned how important collaboration is. And the thing I've learned is, you know, I don't always have the best ideas. There are other people in the room that have better ideas. And so you really elevate the organization the more uh, you get input from everybody in the company. I love that. I heard a quote the other day. They said, if you're the smartest one in the room all the time, you need to find another room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. It's good advice. So uh, thank you. I Boy, I can't add much to, to what you just said there. I, I love love your advice. You're clearly a veteran leader and, uh, and a, a great individual. We really have enjoyed having this discussion. I guess finally, just for the listeners, What's the one takeaway that you would leave them with here at the end of our discussion? Uh, thanks for uh, asking that question, Mike. Do something. I made uh, a comment at the outset or you know, during the middle of my presentation. You know, uh, have a conversation. Have a toolbox. Do a toolbox talk. Have an overall conversation with your with with your folks. Maybe the you know, in a construction company, maybe you have a you bring everyone in and you talk about this issue collectively and you'll be shocked at some of the comments you'll get from people do something and if you do something you will lead to removing the stigma and if you remove the stigma and you create awareness we can actually make a difference when it comes to this topic i think we have uh, made a difference so far but there is a long way to go Um, there's there are still way too many people who died by suicide Um, Mental health is really not uh, discussed enough in our society. It's too difficult a conversation, and we need to remove the stigma. There you have it, folks. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Stuart. I've really enjoyed the conversation and always get to know you better uh, when when we have these opportunities. I'm, I appreciate them. Thank you, Mike. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk about this important subject. Thanks for your your uh, organization and your leadership. You bet. All right. We'll look forward to connecting again soon. Thanks, Mike. All right. Thank you to the listeners for joining us today on the Mobile Workforce Podcast. If you enjoyed the conversation that Stuart and I had today and have an opportunity to share that out with your coworkers or associates or other contacts that you have in the industry, we feel like this is a very important topic and something that cannot be overstated or discussed enough. Uh, We always love those five-star ratings and reviews on the podcast. Give us a review. Let us know how we're doing, what you liked, and make sure to share this episode with others. After After all, our goal is to help you improve not only your business, but your life.